We were a family. We were normal. And then in a split second, it was shattered. Absolutely shattered. March the 3rd, 1984. The trial of 33-year-old Arthur Gary Bishop is about to begin in Salt Lake City, Utah. This mild-mannered bookkeeper is accused of kidnapping and murder. One of the things that was most troubling was to learn that the face of evil was so benign. He seemed like he could be no threat to anyone. And he had committed one of the most terrific crimes in Utah history. I couldn't stop, and I would go do it again if I had the chance. This is the shocking story of how a murderer hid from justice for years, and how one seasoned detective cracked the case in a single day. In the calmest voice whatsoever, he just goes, uh-uh. He's not hurt, he's dead. And I said, well, how do you know he's dead? He says, because I killed him. In 1965, Shona and John Cunningham arrive in Salt Lake City, Utah, from Glasgow, Scotland. They hope to find a better life in a city that, thanks to its Mormon heritage, has a reputation for family values and clean living. We had a daughter who was 15 months old and thought it would be a nice place to rear children. And we had friends here uh, from Glasgow who thought the same thing. They had one child also. The Cunninghams have two more children, Ian, and in 1970, Graham. By the early 1980s, they had settled in this house, in a quiet part of the city. On the evening of July the 14th, 1983, Graham, now 13 years old, receives a phone call. Graham came by, and I said, where are you going? Or I said, I'm just going to run to the store. And I said, well, don't be long. And that was just before 8.30 that evening. And that was the last I saw him. Never saw him again. By 1 o'clock in the morning, we uh, called the police. When the police came, they gave us the story about it has to be 24 hours and did he run away? And, and I said, no. Uh, he wouldn't do that. Shona was determined that the police take serious action and not just file the case away. Nothing much happened. Everybody was going to do something, but nothing seemed to be happening. I mean, this was my son, and I was going to find him. At that time, she was working in a very nice French restaurant. Uh, it was very close to the courts building. A lot of judges and attorneys and civic people, politicians, would go there for dinner and lunch. I called the chief of police. I knew him, and I said, my son didn't run away. In an effort to appease Shona, the department assigns veteran detective Don Bell to the case for one week only. Graham is missing for four days by the time Don gets to work. Despite his experience, he cannot find any sign of the boy. The most promising lead comes from Graham's school friends. Graham, for months, had planned on going on a California vacation with a friend of his, a young boy named Jeff, and Jeff's stepdad, a man by the name of Roger Downs. And they had set this up, oh, clear back in January. And there were a number of boys that were going to go. One by one, they kind of dropped out, but Graham was still planning on going. So this was a big trip for him. Don makes a concerted effort to speak with the adult leading the trip, 32-year-old Roger Downs and his stepson, 13-year-old Jeff. But he cannot reach either of them. We did come up with another boy who said, well, you know, Jeff's dad's not really his dad. And we said, well, we know that. He's a stepdad. They go, no, he's not even a stepdad. 
and that got our interest. So we started doing some intensive work on trying to find Roger. Don discovers that Roger Downs is, in fact, an alias. The man's real name is Arthur Gary Bishop. He also learns Bishop had used his position as a bookkeeper to steal money from his employer, the tourism agency Ski Utah. But before Don can act on this information, his week-long assignment to the case ends. On Friday, July the 22nd, he leaves the case file with a junior detective. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. And I said, look at it this way. If he did have something to do with Graham and he knows the police are involved, he's never coming back. Two days later, on Sunday, July 24th, Don gets a call at home with some startling news about Arthur Bishop. Steve says he's called. What should I do? I said, go interview him. And he said, well, I don't feel really comfortable doing that, and could you come in and help me just, I know it's an imposition, but, you know, it shouldn't take very long. And I kind of rolled my eyes and said, well, okay, I guess. Before he can confront Bishop, Don needs to know more about his relationship with Jeff and why Bishop claims to be Jeff's dad. To get Jeff talking freely, Don takes him into his office alone. He was an odd young man. He just, he didn't respond right to my questions. And I knew all through this interview that Roger was not Jeff's dad. But through the entire interview, Jeff referred to him as my dad, my dad, my dad. I even asked him, I said, you love your dad? Yes. Does he love you? Yes. And again, that was just one of those weird things that, this is weird. So. This is a parting shot. I just asked him, I said, how long has your dad been molesting you? And there was just absolute silence in the room for what seemed like a lifetime. And, and the little guy said, all of my life. It's a shocking revelation. The man outside Don's office is not just a thief and a fraudster. He is a pedophile. And Don is now seriously concerned he has done something to Graham. Don needs to get Bishop talking fast, so under the guise of routine questioning, Don gets him in front of a tape recorder. I started asking him, I says, we're going through the same thing with you that we've done with other adults and we're trying to track down Graham and when was the last time you talked with him? And he says, well, I think I talked with him uh, midweek sometime, he wasn't real sure. I could tell that he was dancing around a lot, not being totally truthful with this, and so I changed. As I got more aggressive with him, then he started getting a little bit more uptight. And finally, I made the mistake of, of bringing up that I think you're another person. I thought he was going to invoke and ask for his attorney and quit talking, and I figured it was over. But I gave him his rights, and amazing, even to me, he agreed to keep talking. And that that I have to freely admit I hadn't planned for. But even though Bishop will talk, he refuses to say anything more on tape. Don places Bishop under arrest, but for several hours keeps trying to coax him into talking again. I said, what is the hang up here? I said, if you tell me, I'm going to write stuff down. And he says, well, I don't want you to play the recording. I said, so play it to who? And he says, the press. And I said, well, we're not going to play it to the press. After another hour of expert persuasion, Bishop finally agrees to tell all on tape. I said something about Graham. I said, you know, I, I know something's happened to Graham. Maybe he's hurt. Maybe there was an accident. And in the calmest voice whatsoever, he just goes, uh-uh. I says, uh, uh why? He goes, he's not hurt, he's dead. I said, well, how do you know he's dead? He says, because I killed him. And I think it took about 52 minutes after that for him to explain all of the murders. Don is dumbstruck as Bishop reveals how, over a four-year period, he has killed not one, but five boys. 
Bishop starts at the end by confessing to his fifth and most recent murder, Graham. He explains to Don that he called Graham the night he disappeared, invited him to his house and asked him to pose naked. Worried Graham would tell on him, Bishop hits the boy over the head with a hammer, then drowns him in the bathtub. All through this, his voice never changed. Never got emotional, never went up, never went down. It was just very calm. Uh, he said, I killed them all. I said, killed all who? He says, all the missing boys that are missing. I said, what missing boys that are missing? And then I remembered, oh, wow, we have this big task force. I said, Troy Ward? Because I just threw one out there. He goes, yeah, I did him. I said, great. <laughs> Rather than start at the beginning, Bishop goes through the killings in reverse order. He explains that his fourth murder took place just one month prior to Graham Cunningham's death. On June the 22nd, 1983, he snatched a six-year-old boy named Troy Ward from this street corner. He said all of a sudden he heard it little voice yell at him from the curb saying, hi, are you, are you lost? Are, are you looking for Liberty Park? And he says, so I thought, sure, I'm looking for Liberty Park. The little guy says, I can show you where it is. I said, why don't you show me? And he says, he walked right over, opened the passenger door of my car and climbed in. He says, I drove him to my house, took him down in the basement, tied him up, molested him. He started to cry. He says, I hate it when they cry. I told him to shut up, he wouldn't shut up. He says, so I took a big mallet that I had down there and I beat him. Don listens as Bishop continues to work back through time. In the same matter-of-fact tone, Bishop relates the details of his third murder, which took place on October the 25th, 1981. He explains how he spots his third victim, four-year-old Danny Davis, in a supermarket then lures him home with the promise of toys before also molesting and killing him in his basement. Bishop's grim tale goes on. He tells Don about his second murder. On November the 11th, 1980, he kills 11-year-old Kim Peterson. After meeting Kim at a roller rink, he lures him to a remote desert location on the pretext of going hunting. Bishop's real intention is to take pornographic pictures. And when he suspects Kim might reveal his secret, he shoots him. He never had the courage to actually physically grab them and take them. He says he used to laugh when he'd hear those reports that, you know, a child had been kidnapped. He says, I could never kidnap. He says, how do you kidnap a child? He says, you know, grab them. They're going to scream. They're going to kick. They're going to fight. They're gonna, there's all this attention. He says, kids will do anything. He says, you offer them money, you offer them toys, you offer them treats. He says, they'll do anything. Bishop ends his confession at the beginning with his very first murder. On October the 16th, 1979, Bishop was living in this apartment complex. Across the way was a little boy who caught his eye that day. He was four. His name was Alonzo Daniels. He lived in the same apartment complex. Uh, he was just standing in the doorway. He looked, there was a little guy out there playing on the lawn. Bishop tells Alonzo that he has plenty of toys at his place, especially in the bathroom. He says, so I put water in the tub, took his clothes off, let him play with the boat. And he says, as he was playing with the boat, I fondled him. And he says, the little boy kept saying, you're not supposed to do that. My mom has told me, you're not supposed to touch me there. And he says, I knew if I let him go, he would tell, and then you guys would come. Five murders in four years. In the space of one Sunday afternoon, Don Bell has discovered a serial killer that no one even knew existed. Nobody had considered the possibility that one man could be responsible for all these crimes. 
you don't come up with a missing person and your first thought is, I have some serial killer pedophile person out there doing, that's just not on the radar as the number one thought process. Bishop finishes his gruesome tale in less than an hour. Fearful, he'll withdraw cooperation again. Don asks Bishop to take police to the boys' graves that night. He agrees to lead them into the desert, 40 miles southwest of town. Detective Smith and another detective by the name of Johnson took him out to the desert. And it was dark. It was 10 o'clock at night. And he walked him right to the grave sites, even in pitch black dark. And that, later we found out he'd gone back to the graves and visited him periodically. So he was quite familiar. Bishop's first three victims, Alonzo Daniels, Kim Peterson, and Danny Davis, were buried in shallow graves in Utah's West Desert. He took the bodies of Troy Ward and Graham Cunningham to the Wasatch Mountains and threw them into Big Cottonwood Creek, 15 miles southeast of Salt Lake City. Bishop's confession comes 10 days after Graham's disappearance. His mother, Shona, frantic with worry, still has no inkling of the terrible truth. Detectives now face the awful task of breaking the news to her. They came to the house the next morning and brought the chaplain. I mean, that's the dead giveaway. And we sat down at the table, and they told us that Art had confessed to the murders of the five children. And he, uh, He explained where he had buried each child, and actually, they found Graham's body first. And within feet of him was Troy Ward, who had been thrown in there three weeks before. He took Graham from me that night. He knew Graham was at home, I was at home. He took him from us, literally. That was his control. It was the godlike power of deciding whether it was going to be life or death. By the end of the week, the Salt Lake County Attorney's Office charged Bishop with five counts of murder, five counts of aggravated kidnapping, and one count of sexual assault on Graham Cunningham. We had some pretty bad ones. We had multiple murderers. We had people who had you know, done all sorts of murders, but to have five over a period of time, calculated, cold. On March the 3rd, 1984, Bishop's trial begins at Salt Lake City's Hall of Justice. The parents of each one of his victims are in court to hear him plead not guilty. I had to sit and look at, I didn't have to, I didn't need to go there, but I was bound and determined he was gonna see my face if I had to look at his. And uh, he was quite relaxed. He turned and smiled, like, oh, there's somebody I know. I mean, it was so unreal. It's interesting that sometimes you think, well, it's really easy to prosecute a case when you have all this evidence, when it's just the opposite. The pressure is on you, and you have to do almost a perfect job. And if you were to lose it, you know, you'd get the blame. With Bishop's confession in hand, the prosecution have no concerns about proving he killed the boys. But to secure the death penalty, they still must prove each killing was a calculated, deliberate act. We had charged him with first degree murder, which carried a capital sentence as, as a possible punishment. We wanted him convicted of that. We wanted to be able to go in front of a jury and say, now you get to decide, does he deserve the death penalty for this crime, or does he deserve to stay in prison for the rest of his life? Lead prosecutor Robert Stott opens his case by painting a stark picture of the defendant, a predatory pedophile and serial killer, masquerading as an upright citizen. We tried to show how reasonable he was, uh, how he could act normal, and how he did act normal, and how he could deceive people. Bishop used this facade of normality to disarm suspicious parents and lure unsuspecting children into his grasp. 
We found out that he had invited a lot of little boys over to his house, and he had videotapes that he'd show them, and they'd, the parents were not particularly alarmed uh, because of the kind of mild-mannered person he presented himself to be. Then on March the 13th, Bishop's attorneys begin their defense with a daring strategy. They were shooting for manslaughter, claiming that he had killed them under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance for which there was a reasonable explanation or excuse. Bishop's lawyers tried to persuade the jury that, fueled by pornography and coupled with his insatiable lust for young boys, Bishop developed murderous impulses that he is unable to control. When he found himself in the presence of his victims, he unthinkingly struck out. They suggest that, in effect, each murder was an accident. They had brought in an expert to talk about pornography, trying to show that he was addicted and how it desensitized him. In other words, kind of uh, hoping the jury would play into this as some sort of excuse, or at least some sort of a reason why he killed these little boys. The reason he killed was not because of the pornography, not because he was desensitized, but because he was afraid these little boys were gonna tell their parents and they would tell the police and he would go to prison. The prosecution's case lasted for two weeks. Bishop's attorneys rest after just two days. On March 19th, the jury retires to consider its verdict. They must choose between manslaughter and first-degree murder. I can't remember how long they were out, but they were going to send them to the hotel. And within minutes, they came back and said no. Uh, the jury has a verdict. So we all went back into court. And that's when they read the verdict. Bishop is found guilty on all 11 counts, including five counts of first-degree murder. Some people made some noise of uh, appreciation for the, the verdict, which really wasn't appropriate, but everybody was so high-strung. Two days after the guilty verdicts, the court reconvenes to decide if Bishop will be sent to prison for life or if he will be put to death. We had a psychologist go down and interview him, and he called me afterwards and he said there was one time where it appeared that he was expressing some remorse, and he said, Danny Davis, what a waste. And I thought he was going to say, you know, poor little boy, died, you know, and instead he said, I didn't get any sexual satisfaction out of it. So it, it, it appeared to be if there was any justification for the ultimate sanction under Utah law, this was the case. Oh, I had no doubt. I had absolutely no doubt this man had to die. To try and persuade the jury to recommend the death sentence, prosecutors present a chilling insight into the mind of Arthur Gary Bishop. During the trial, we presented the testimony of the confession through Don Bell. It was at the penalty phase that we actually played the tape because of the impact of that, actually hearing his words and his voice was so chilling. And uh, it was very powerful. Actually, in a way, I feel good telling about this, but at the same time, I know I'm damning myself to hell for doing it. Well, my friend. But I'm glad you caught me because I couldn't stop, and I would go do it again if I had the chance. Because I get around little kids, and I start shaking, I get nervous, I get turned on, and uh, I, mean, I can't pass a kid on the street, you know. I, I look down to see what kind of crotch he's got, and uh, it's just not right. It's just, I guess it'd be one thing to have sex with him, but then killing him after is just, mm -hmm. The jury deliberates for almost 11 hours. Then at close to one in the morning, they return with their verdict. Well, it's gratifying to know that 12 people agree with us that this case, the only just penalty was death. Well, you can say you, uh, uh, you're relieved, or you're pleased, or you're happy, or you're... 
I felt the proper verdict came back. On March the 27th, 1984, Bishop is given five death sentences. He has one automatic appeal before the Utah Supreme Court in 1985. His lawyers argued that the jury was biased against him and that his confession was inadmissible in court because he was not allowed to exercise his right to silence. These arguments are rejected and his death sentence stands. Mark, would you rather die than life in prison? Yes. Under Utah laws of the time, Bishop can choose his method of execution, firing squad or lethal injection. His choice of death by lethal injection is carried out on June the 10th, 1988. You know, time doesn't heal. Forget that. But if suddenly you lost your leg, or your arm, or your life changed so drastically that you had to find a, a different way to live, that's what you do. And as you become more familiar, you become a bit more proficient. If you had a, a prosthesis instead of your leg, you would become more efficient. But you still want your leg. There would never be a second of the day where you didn't think about your leg. And that's what you do about your children. It's been 28 years, it doesn't change. It just becomes more familiar. June the 28th, 2006, 19 months after someone broke into her house, hacked her husband to death with an ax, and left her for dead in a pool of blood. Joan Porco arrives for the trial of her alleged attacker. Incredibly, she walks into the courtroom arm in arm with the man accused of the crime, her son, Christopher. In order to provide justice for her, and for her husband, it meant having to destroy, you know, her son. But despite allegedly indicating to police that Christopher was the axe man, at the trial she says she has no recollection of the crime or who was responsible. It's just silly um, to think that Christopher Porco would want to kill or maim his parents for money. This is the story of a son who lived a double life and a mother who stood by him. In the early 1990s, Joan and Peter Porco raised their two children in the small town of Del Mar in upstate New York. The Porcos are well known and respected in their neighborhood. Joan is a speech therapist at a local elementary school. Peter is a clerk to a judge in Albany. Peter Porco was a beloved figure. Um, he was known to the entire legal community, and he was revered because of his devotion to the law and his, the hard work that he did uh, as a clerk to the presiding judge of the mid-level appeals court. Plus, he was a nice guy. Their eldest son, Jonathan, becomes a lieutenant in the US Navy. Younger brother, Christopher, studies economics at Rochester Institute of Technology. 200 mile drive from the family home. On November the 15th, 2004, 
this apparently tight-knit family is torn apart. Peter Porco fails to show up for work that morning. A colleague drives over to the house to investigate. What confronts him is truly shocking. He calls the police. The crime scene initially, you know, by all reports, was appeared to be a bloodbath. Blood everywhere in the house. Um, upon further investigation, what was learned was that Peter had, Peter and Joan had been attacked in their bed. 52-year-old Peter had staggered around the house for some time after the attack. He's found at the foot of the stairs, his neck almost completely severed. There's no sign of the attacker, but a screen on a side window has been torn off. So at first, it appears to be a botched burglary. The police search downstairs for clues. But lead detective Chris Bowdish is not so sure robbery is the motive. He has a hunch the attack was carried out by someone close to the family. The search continues upstairs, where the murder weapon is discovered in the Porco's bedroom, lying on the bed, caked in blood. Next to it is 52-year-old Joan Porco. Clinging to life, she suffered multiple lacerations to her face and body. But before Mrs. Porco is taken to hospital, she seems to be able to communicate. He asked her, um, you know, Mrs. Porco, can you hear me? And he indicates that she nodded her head. Um, what was interesting is that in addition, she was shaking her finger up and down. Detective Bowdish asks her if she knows her attacker. And she nodded her head and waved her finger up and down. And he asked her, was it Jonathan? And she shook her head back and forth and waved her finger back and forth. Um, he said, was it Christopher? And she again nodded her head and, and put her finger up and down. This nod from Joan Porco will be hotly debated in court. A reporter from the Albany newspaper, The Times Union, finds 21-year-old Christopher Porco before the police can at his college in Rochester. Christopher ends up calling the Bethlehem Police Department, the home, his hometown police agency, and inquiring, saying, I just received a call. Can you tell me what's going on? Hi, uh, my name is Chris Porco. I was just called by the Times Union saying that my parents were found dead this afternoon. Um, I was wondering if you had any information for me. When you listen to the, his demeanor during that phone call, uh, somebody had, rep had described it as he sounded like he was reporting that he had found a, uh, somebody's hubcap. Porco drives to Albany to be by his mother's side. But her nod and his demeanor on the phone has already moved him to the top of the list of suspects. Now, all the police need to confirm Christopher as the killer is to have the eyewitness, his mother, repeat her allegation. She spends several days in a medically induced coma. When she wakes, she tells detectives she can no longer remember anything about the attack, let alone implicate her son. During her recovery, she even writes to the local newspaper pleading with police to leave her son alone and find her husband's real killer. But the police continue to suspect Christopher and over the coming months, gradually piece together the evidence to build a case against him. But we spent a year, you know, trying to prove that he didn't do it. And, and that was the approach we, we took. We said, let's try to prove he didn't do it and, and see how that turns out. And every turn, every corner pointed to him. Almost exactly a year after the attacks, Christopher is indicted for the second degree murder of his father and attempted murder of his mother. But since his mother continues to plead his innocence, he's granted bail. Bail in a murder case in New York State is extremely rare. Hardly ever is it granted. 
and Christopher was granted bail. And I, I, I know because uh, I have eyes to see and ears to hear, I know that uh, his being not in jail, being um, at liberty, uh, was uh, very, very uh, annoying to the police. On June the 28th, 2005, at the Orange County Courthouse in Goshen, New York, a seven-week duel begins. On one side, prosecutor David Rossi. On the other, defense attorney Terence L. Kindlin, battling over the bloody details of the Polko case. More than 80 witnesses will take the stand, all captured by a newspaper photographer, the only camera allowed in the courtroom. Christopher Porco and his mother walk into court arm in arm on the first day of the trial. She's dealing with loss uh, of her husband and her partner, um, but also dealing with the destruction of her family. And it's all being played out in the front pages of the news, and it's being played out in an open courtroom for the entire world to see. The prosecution is first to address the jury. Central to David Rossi's case is proving that Christopher has motive. We were able to obtain emails, correspondence between Christopher and his mother, Christopher and his father. And in the weeks, months leading up to this incident, it was clear that the relationship was deteriorating. Christopher's relationship with his father had gone downhill because he was in terrible debt. He'd been living beyond his means. When this happened, a lot of his suite mates and fraternity brothers were amazed to learn that he wasn't a multimillionaire, um, because that is what he had led them to believe. He had forged his father's signature on loans. Christopher had forged his father's signature on a loan for a Jeep that he was driving. Um, and a lot of this stuff was coming to a head, and Peter um, was, was on to him. The prosecution suggests Christopher had already gone to extreme lengths to solve his financial problems. This was not the first time that the Bethlehem police had been to the Porco residence. They had been there on prior occasions investigating thefts of um, computers. He had stolen uh, his parents' laptops, and then they had called the police and reported them stolen. This evidence is controversial because his parents didn't press charges, so the case never went to court. Next, the prosecution turns to Christopher's alibi. When questioned, he told the police he never left his university dorm the night of the attacks. And it told everybody where he was, that he was in the lounge at his dorm room. And unfortunate for Christopher that night, the kids had decided to watch a movie. So there were kids in that lounge all night long, hanging out, watching movies till the early morning hours. And every, we had every one of them uh, we interviewed, and every one of them said Christopher was not here. Having discredited his alibi in the second week of the trial, the prosecution presents their theory of what really happened that night. On the night in question, Christopher had left the university in his Jeep. Um, we had surveillance footage of him leaving, heading toward the throughway. The Porco residence in Delmar is exactly 232 miles from Christopher's university dorm in Rochester. His yellow Jeep is captured on surveillance cameras leaving the campus at 10.30 p.m. on November the 14th. And passing a toll booth on the New York State Thruway east towards Albany 15 minutes later. There you go, hon. At 1.51 a.m., a toll booth operator in Albany testifies she received payment from a man matching Porco's description. This toll booth is just 10 miles from the Porco house. The prosecution then shows the court a picture of the Porco's front door the morning after the attack. In the lock is a spare house key normally hidden beneath a flower pot. And yet more evidence suggests the killer knows the house well. Shortly thereafter, we had the alarm system at, at the uh, Porco residence being disarmed with the master code. 
Christopher's brother Jonathan testifies only six people know the code. Christopher being one of them. The prosecution claims that minutes later, Christopher went to the basement where Peter Porco stores his tools and picked up an ax. They estimate that sometime after 2.15 a.m., he made his way upstairs and attacked his parents asleep in their bed. At the autopsy, it was discovered that Peter Porco sustained 16 blows to the head and upper body, one of them penetrating his skull. His wife, Joan, lost her left eye and part of her skull. After the attack, Christopher slipped away. David Rossi tells the court that, assuming his parents were dead, Christopher damaged a window to make it appear the attack was a byproduct of a botched burglary attempt. To add more weight to the deception, he cut the phone lines at precisely 4.54 a.m. He then drove the 232 miles back to Rochester. Shortly after the phone wire is cut, a car gets on the New York State Thruway. There's a toll ticket handed out, travels from Albany back to Rochester. In Rochester, surveillance cameras captured Christopher's distinctive yellow Jeep arriving back on campus at 8.30 a.m. With Christopher's alibi in tatters, the prosecution calls his mother to testify. Would she stand by her son? Or could she be persuaded to indicate again that Christopher was the attacker? For the prosecution, Joan Porco was an extraordinarily delicate and difficult witness to handle. She was a sympathetic figure, and therefore uh, the people could not, you know, approach her as a witness in the way that, that uh, we would have another witness, you know, under different circumstances. To the defense's delight, Joan Porco repeats that she has no memory of the attacks. Mrs. Porco's present recollection only extends up until a point that's about oh, 36 hours before the attack. And then her memory doesn't come back online until about four weeks after the attack. So there's this huge um, black hole in her memory. And in, inside that hole somewhere is the attack itself. After a month of testimony from medical experts, police officers, and Christopher's family and friends, the prosecution case is almost complete. But they save their best till last. A neighbor of the Porcos, Marshal Goki, testifies that very late on the night of the attack, he saw Christopher's yellow Jeep. We had a neighbor down the road. Um, again, stroke of luck is going to work just before four that morning, which is just before the time we think Chris left, and saw Chris's Jeep in the driveway. On August the 4th, 2005, the prosecution rests, and veteran attorney Terence L. Kindlin takes the floor for the defense. Since um, I started to do this work back when Richard Nixon was still president of the United States, uh, which is to say 1974, uh, it has been my privilege to defend uh, so many people charged with murder that I've literally lost count at this point. And uh, they're just not easy cases. Uh, Christopher's case was especially difficult. He's an artist in the courtroom. Well, you know, I've said that to him before. He, yeah, he has a way of just capturing the attention of the jurors. Kindlin begins by arguing that the prosecution's case is entirely circumstantial. The judge will explain to the jury that when dealing with a case that is exclusively circumstantial, where there's no direct evidence, the law requires that they draw an inference that is consistent with innocence. It's almost like an instruction to find this person not guilty. Kindlin paints a picture not of an evil son who wants to kill his parents for money, but a stupid kid who's made mistakes and loves his family. My take was that he was not 
uh, a master thief, that he was an irresponsible college student uh, who had a credit card. And we gave the jury a laundry list of um, factors that were, that were either suggested innocence uh, or that were simply not present in, in this case. First on the list is the crime scene itself. Kindland argues with such an incredibly violent attack, the killer should have been covered in blood. It was a bloodbath. It was like a slaughterhouse. There was blood everywhere. There was blood on the ceiling. There was blood on the wall and the floor and the bed and the ax. And, uh, and blood, is, blood is difficult to get off. And it's inconceivable to think that he could have committed these crimes and then without having cleaned up because there was no evidence of any cleanup in the home, then gotten into his Jeep and not gotten blood all over everything. No bloody clothes, no bloody fingerprints, no bloody footprints, no bloody boots, nothing. The prosecution responds with evidence from blood spatter experts who challenge Kindland's argument. And when the experts examine the photographs and the direction of the blood spatter, it was their conclusion that the person who committed the crime, whoever it was, would not have had a significant amount of blood on their person. Rossi argues that Christopher has been well trained in cleaning up blood. We presented evidence that he had worked at a veterinary hospital and he was used to dealing with blood. He would, he would assist the veterinarian uh, during procedures with the scrubs. He knew all about that. Uh, so we threw that out there as, as, a, as a possibility. The defense turns to Joan Porco's infamous nod of yes when asked by detectives if Christopher was the attacker. Their star witness is Dr. Mary Don Bovey, an eminent neurologist. Her testimony was that Joan Porco could not possibly have recorded any memory of who assaulted her, so that her nod was utterly meaningless. And she confirmed that uh, Mrs. Porco had no recollection, no memory, uh, no trace of any memory about what had happened that night. So that we felt that that negated the claim that Mrs. Porco's nod meant something. Rossi strikes back, claiming the nod is not significant to their case. The head nod was not a huge piece of the proof in this case. It had to be a piece of proof because it got the police off and running and it explained why they immediately focused on Christopher. But it didn't end there. If you were to speak with a prosecutor, they would say it meant nothing. Uh, it was insignificant. Um, and had nothing to do with the verdict itself. This insignificant, meaningless evidence that the prosecution would have you believe um, meant nothing. Um, they brought it up four times in their opening statement and 12 times in their closing argument. One witness who could possibly offer more insight into the case was Christopher Porco. But his attorneys advise him not to testify. For closing arguments, the judge allows a video camera into the courtroom. Defense counsel Laurie Shanks argues that the police were so sure Christopher was the killer from the start, they failed to search for evidence that might lead to the real killer. Or they simply don't look for the evidence, then an innocent person's life can be lost. But David Rossi's colleague, Mike McDermott, argues the circumstantial evidence is damning. Using the master code to disarm the alarm when he went to his parents' house that morning, ladies and gentlemen, was like dropping his wallet at the crime scene. Finally, McDermott offers the jury two theories. Christopher Porco is guilty, or number two, that Christopher Porco is the unluckiest man on the face of the planet. After a 23-day trial involving dozens of witnesses, hundreds of exhibits, police audio tapes, photographs, surveillance video, and emails, the jury retires to make its decision. 
waiting for a jury is one of the most uh, agonizing forms of, um, of torment that any lawyer who tries cases can possibly experience. The jury returns after just six hours. So soon that Joan Porco doesn't even make it back from her hotel to the courthouse in time. The clerk first requests the verdict for the murder of Peter Porco. Guilty. And for the attempted murder of his mother. Guilty. Relief, definitely. Um, you know, pleased that the jury saw it the way we saw it. There were no celebrations here. There were no high fives. This was really a, 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 it was a case that it was difficult to feel anything other than um, continued, you know, sorrow for for Mrs. Porco and the rest of her family. For his crimes, Christopher Porco is sentenced to 50 years in prison. Meanwhile, his defense team has tried appealing already. They claim they will keep trying based on two key moments during the trial. First, Kindland argues that Mrs. Porco's nod should never have been admitted as evidence. Because she has no recollection of the attack, she could not be cross-examined about what the nod meant. As a result of allowing this evidence into court, Chris Porco's constitutional rights were breached. The second issue, Kindland believes, was even more damaging. The evidence that Porco had stolen from his parents before. One of the points of contention during the trial was whether or not the prosecutor would be permitted to use the evidence of these prior burglaries at Christopher's home against him as part of the murder proof. Um, the court ruled that he would be permitted uh, to do so, and we had the sense that that was devastating evidence. Um, we also argued uh, and continue to argue that that evidence should not have been admitted at the trial because it was too prejudicial. As Christopher Porco sits in prison, his terribly disfigured mother continues to visit him. Mrs. Porco, in, in our opinion, was continued to be in a state of denial about uh, her son's involvement. 